You know, Jesus came to the place where he, he had to say, well, he said, I don't want to do this. <laughs> but your will. And I felt a bit like that when I was preparing for today. Lord, I don't want to do this. But I submit to you. And so the songs today were really good and relevant for me. I surrender all. I surrender my voice to God. I surrender my time to God. I surrender the church to God. And uh, that's good, isn't it? You know, everything I want to say today, and I hope I get through it, if not, let's pass lunch. Uh, it's all based on love. You know, Jesus said, or the scriptures say, that love is the highest way. Our faith works by love. It says that if we don't have love, everything that we do is a clanging symbol. And so, our Christian life, our discipleship is based on love. Not on law, not on I should, not on I must, not I've been told to. But of course there are commands. And Jesus himself said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. So it, that doesn't mean, oh blimey, I've got to keep his commands. Well, I say I love him, so I better do it. No, it's because when you love him, you are motivated and your love for him means that you will. It's the driving force of everything you do in the kingdom. Amen. He also said this, he who is forgiven much, loves much. And if there's a missing ingredient in the church today, it's that knowledge and understanding of how much we've been forgiven. When I was 15 and I was not a Christian, I prayed a very serious prayer that God answered. I said, Lord, show me myself. <laughs> I got it out of a book. <clears throat> and he did. He showed me what I was like deep down inside and how much I needed his grace and his love and his mercy and forgiveness. It took me two years to surrender, but I did. <clears throat> At the age of 17. And I think that sometimes we lack real discipleship because we don't have that love that flows from that deep understanding of what we've been taken out of and how much we've been forgiven. Jimmy preached last week, his title is the same as mine, this week, I don't know if we've got the picture, but how deep is your love? I would say that the, the depth of your love for God is, is measured by the depth of your understanding of what he's saved you from. I'm going to hold up a mirror. You know, it says that, doesn't it? It says that the word of God is like a mirror and you can look in it and then walk away and forget what you saw. It's like going to a mirror and seeing something on your face that shouldn't be there. That's very embarrassing, you know, maybe some food or something else. I won't go into details about. And you walk away and you don't do anything about it. My prayer for us, church, is as we're going forward into this new place, this new season, is that we look in the mirror of God's word and we see what God wants of us and we say, I surrender. Because you love me so much. Amen. You know, when God called me to preach, which was a long time before I was a pastor, believe me, I did 10 years as an elder in a church, and one of the scriptures he gave me was Ezekiel 3, 18, 21. And this is tough. This is God speaking. When I say to the wicked, you will surely die and you do not warn him or speak out to warn the wicked from his wicked ways that he may live, that wicked man will die in his sin 
but his blood I will require at your hand. That's my hand. Yet if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he will die in his wickedness or iniquity, but you've delivered yourself. And it, and it goes on about the righteousness and so on. I'm not going to go into all of that, but it's, it, was like, it was a strong word on my life. It was like, hey, I'm giving you a place of responsibility in my church, the body, and I want you to deliver everything that you give me to deliver, because if not, I will require something at your ha- from your hand. I, I don't know what that means in the New Testament, but it made me shake when I was a young man in the Lord when I realised how serious a thing it is to stand in front of believers and deliver the word of God and be honest about it. So we're where we are, the hub church, we have been drastically pruned. Yes, we know that. And, you know, I have a picture of a bodleia that I used to have in my old house, and it used to grow massive branches and they're beautiful flowers and lots of butterflies would come, but it used to get really out of hand. And then every year, you get my big, big clippers out and chop it viciously back and it just had these stubs that were left. And then the following season, before the end of the season, it was right up here again with beautiful flowers and lots of butterflies. Well, we're there. Okay, aren't we? Maybe you don't think we are, but I, I, we are. But it was God's hand. He's the shearer. He's the vine dresser. He's the one who says, if you bear fruit, and the Hub Church has seen a lot of fruit over the years. It really has. Many souls have been saved and baptised and changed. He says, I will prune so that you bear more fruit. So guess what, church? We're on the road to bearing more fruit. I believe that with all my heart. Now this other scripture that God gave to me when I was a young man and beginning to teach, it kind of shaped my Christian life. It's from the book of Haggai when God's speaking about his house, who we are. That's what, that's what the scripture says, whose house we are. And it says, In the second year of Darius the king, on the first day of the month, or first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai, to Zerubbabel, the son of, oh, these words, Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the people say, the people say, but I say, seen that before. You say, but I say. Jesus said that a lot. The people say, the time has not come. The time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. And then the word of the Lord came to Haggai, the prophet, saying, is it time for you, yourselves, to dwell in your panelled houses while this house lies desolate? Now therefore, says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways You so much and harvest little. You eat and there's not enough to be satisfied. You drink and there's not enough to become drunk. (laughs) Not that we want to do that. You put on clothes, but you're not warm enough. And he who earns earns wages to put in a purse with holes. And thus says the Lord, consider your ways. And I think that's what God wants to say to us today. Consider your ways. Look in the mirror and see where you are. Go to the mountain, bring wood, rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it and glorified. You look for much, behold it comes to little. And when you bring it home, I blow it away. Why? Because of my house which lies desolate, which while each of you runs to his own house. That's strong, isn't it? But it kind of shaped my heart, my soul, when I thought, yes, God's house is the most important house in this world. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, so all that stuff out there in the world is a lot less important than the house of God. So, I started off by saying that love is our motivation, but you know, 
everything that God requires of us, everything that God commands, if you love me, keep my commands, they all have a benefit. We were talking on the way here, uh, I picked up Andy, our drummer, and we were talking about the difference between working for an hourly wage and working piecework. So when I was young, 12, 13 year old, I used to go down to the farm where I lived in Sutton Coalfield and they used to have a harvest time for potatoes and there'd be, you'd have a row each and there'd be hundreds, thousands of potatoes and empty sacks at the beginning of the rows. And we were, I, I can't remember, it was either sixpence, <laughs> it's tiny, or a shilling, a twelfth of a pound, if you filled a sack, a whole sack of potatoes. And I'll tell you what, mate, I've always been competitive, <laughs> but I went mad, mate. I filled up so many sacks of potatoes because I got a shilling for every full sack. And if, you know what? God understands we need incentive and you know everything that he asks for us is a blessing. Everything he requires from us, there's a fruit to it. And I want to read to you Hebrews. It says this. Because I think this is what happens to a lot of people. Um, And it's to do with our discipleship level. It's to do with our level of love. That that the kingdom of God is not put first. And as we go forward as a church, as new people are going to come in, what do we want to see? We want to see them as disciples. We want to see new blood coming in but we want them to be taught the truth of the word because we don't want them to lose out, do we? So it says in Hebrews, where are we? Hebrews 4, therefore let us fear while a promise remains of entering rest any of us will seem to come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us, as they did. But the word that they heard did not profit them. Why? Because it was not united by faith in those who heard. Okay. So the word of God, the enormous blessings and things that God wants to bestow on us, All those words cannot benefit us if we don't mix it with something. And that's called faith. Well, that sounds easy. Well, I believe. And as someone says somewhere in the Bible, well, so do the demons. (laughs) So let's just think just for a moment about what that faith is that we need to mix with all the word and all the promise of God and so we see the benefit. How many of you want to see the benefits? That's a few of you. So James, you probably know this scripture. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but no corresponding action or no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food and one of you says, go in peace, be warmed and filled and yet do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Well, it's no use, is it? Even so, faith, if it has no corresponding action or works, it's dead, it's by itself. But if someone will say, you have faith, You have faith and I have works. I say, show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Awesome, isn't it? And then it says what I just quoted. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons believe and shudder. So it goes on. I'm not going to read all of it. But faith without a corresponding action which is what you have to mix with the word of God to be blessed. So to receive, to mix and be united with faith in the word of God and become what God wants us to be, we mix it with 
the faith that is shown by action. So, give it, let's give you an example. Right? Let's say you have a field. Not many of us have a field spare, do we, nowadays? But let's say you have a field going spare and God says to you, I want you to build a church on there. I mean by that a building. We're the church, this is just a building. But God says, build a building. And you say, well, I haven't got any money. But you know, if you truly believe that word came from God, you can put an action to that. You may not have any money, but you can go and dig a hole. Yes? <laughs> you, can, you can get your shovel or your pickaxe or your fork out. You can go and dig a hole for the foundations when you've got no money at all. And as Jim said, we're getting a new building tomorrow. You might say, 22 foot by 12 building. That's enormous. You saw how many kids we've got? Well, we don't need that, surely. But you know what? I believe what God has said. That our future is a blessed future. A multiplying future. A fruitful future. So having that building is actually digging the hole. Are you with me? Yeah. <laughs> ah, you know, faith, listen, faith prepares. Real faith will always prepare. So listen, there are kinds of people that we will encounter in life and in church when we, when we preach the word, when we give the, the gospel, the good news. And Jesus preparing us for the church in the future and and the things that we would have to face, and no doubt you face some of this yourself. And Jesus tells this story in Luke 14. When one of those who was reclining at the table with him heard what Jesus was saying, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Oh yeah, that's right, it's true, isn't it? Anybody who's going to eat bread in the kingdom, they're blessed. But Jesus said, because he knew something about people. (laughs) A man was giving a big dinner and he invited many. And at the dinner hour he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is ready now. That's the gospel. The gospel is come. Come and receive salvation. And then it says, verse 18, and then this is the thing that we need to know in our heart when we are, as we go forward into the, the new season. But they all alike began to make excuses. <laughs> the first one said, I bought a piece of land. <laughs> Not to build a church on it. <laughs> and I need to go and look at it. I mean, here's a guy who's like, He's been invited to a fantastic thing and he says, I bought a field, I need to go and look at it. Now, you you know, we've heard excuses many, many times as leaders and people in church who inviting people to to enjoy the kingdom of God. They say, well, you know, I've got this piece of land, I want to go and look at it. Excuse me. Another one said, I've brought five yoke of oxen, I'm going to try them out. Excuse me. Another one said, I've married a wife and I can't come. And as the story goes on, you know, in the end Jesus says, just go out and get the poor, the lame, and get the needy, get the broken, get the people who will go, whoa, yes please. What we all know, you know, that as we preach the gospel, it's sad, I know, but not everybody Not every person who even professes Jesus is alive and they've given their life to him. Even Christians will bring up excuses for not being obedient to the word of God. It's very quiet in here. I said it was going to be tough and I didn't want to do this. 
I got a really lovely message I wanted to preach on a very exciting story in the Bible that turned out really amazing. And I cried when I read it and I wanted to share it, but God said, no, no, I want you to ask the people, how deep is your love? I said, okay, I'll surrender. Now there's a little story that Jesus tells in Matthew 21. What do you think, he said? Everything Jesus, all these stories, he's, 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 trying, to, he's trying to provoke people to understand what is required. What do you think? A man had two sons and he came to the first and said, I've got two sons. First son, go to work in the vineyard. And he said, I won't. But afterwards he regretted that. He said he wouldn't and then he did. And then the man came to his second son and he said the same thing. And and this son said, I will. But he didn't go. And Jesus said, which one of the two did the will of the Father? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? The one who said no and then did it. And then he says, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. Now he's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to religious people. He's talking to people, if you like, who go to church. Ouch! He's talking to the religious people and he's saying, look, you know, it's all very well saying, I will, but you never do. Or I believe and you never do. Or I surrender all, but you haven't. This is a challenge to me. I was crying a little bit this morning when we were singing that. Yes, because of my blessed Saviour Jesus, but also because I realised that, as Ian said, I've still, I've still got to surrender more and more in my life. So as he said, don't, don't get too uptight if you're not there. Just make a decision. You're going to take a step forward in surrender today. Be the person that says, maybe I don't want to do it, but then you do it, as Jesus was saying. You know, I will not, but then he goes and does it. The other one said, yeah, you've, you've met people. Yeah, I'll see you, I'll be there, I'll see you, I'll be there. And then they're not there. Let's be people of our word, eh? Anyway, <laughs> let me just say this. They're God's way is good, right? I'm going to talk just for a minute about the benefits. I'm going to talk to you about, well, I'm going to read out, I'm not going to say a lot. There are five promises that are in this scripture from Proverbs. And this is about not forgetting God's teaching, obeying his commandments, and doing what the word of God teaches us. And these are the things that he promises us. So this is the incentive This is why you want to fill as many sacks of potatoes as you can. (laughs) Yeah? God's saying, look, my way's not hard, my yoke's easy, my burden is light. Anyway, Proverbs 3, it says this, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. First promise, for length of days, and years of life and peace they will add to you. (laughs) Hey, what about that for a promise? Do not let kindness and truth leave you. You're going to be playing that a long time, mate. (laughs) Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablets of your heart and this is the second promise. You will find favour and good repute in the sight of God and man. Wow, I'll have some of that. And then trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And this is the third promise. He will make your paths straight. I'll have some of that. And then verse 7. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. And this is the fourth promise. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. And then verse 9. Honour the Lord from the wealth, from your wealth, 
your money. <laughs> and from the first of all your produce, so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. That's, that's amazing, that. Do you know, did you, did you read that as it says it? It says, Honour the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. In other words, as soon as you get it, take something off and give it to the Lord. And then it says, your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves. He loves me. Even a father corrects the son in whom he delights. Oh, God delights in me. He delights in me so much that he will reprove me. He will... He'll hang a mirror in front of me and I will feel, oh, oh. As I did a little bit this morning. Say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you still show me the next step of my life. Show me how I can take the next step of surrender. And maybe God's going to speak to you today about an area of life. To surrender so that you can be you'll be able to say, God is my number one priority and God's house is my number one priority. You know, and Jesus, he never stepped back from speaking the truth, which is what I hope I'm doing today. (laughs) And I want to read this and then I'm going to go on to the last section. So let me do this bit first and then you can start playing. Yeah. <clears throat> so Jesus, after he fed the 5,000 physically with you know, bread and fish, he talks about food that endures for eternal life and the bread that comes down from heaven. That's the spiritual food, yeah? And then he's teaching them about some stuff. <clears throat> he said, unless you eat my flesh and you drink my blood. And they, they were uncomfortable with it. But he was, he was trying to say, look, we did it today. The bread and the wine is a symbol of his body and his blood. And Jesus said, unless you partake of me, spiritually is the bread of heaven. That's what he was saying, but they, they didn't understand it. But let let me say this. He said, verse, um, is it chapter or verse? Verse 60, many of the disciples, when they heard, they said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? And maybe sometimes, or maybe today even, you may be hearing this, what I'm going to finish with, and you're going to say, this is difficult. This This is a difficult statement, but it is God's word. Who can listen to it? <laughs> In other words, who can put up with that? I mean, I want to shut my ears to it. But Jesus, conscious that they were grumbling at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life, but the flesh profits nothing. The words I've spoken to you, they are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe. And in verse 66 it says, as a result of what he just said, many of the disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. And Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away too? And Peter said, oh, I love you, Peter. <laughs> Where shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. You see, they saw something. They saw where life was. They saw where the bread of heaven was. And they, they wanted it, whatever it cost. 
But we do have many now in this present age that when you really confront people with the word of God, it says many withdrew. And you get people in churches. I'm not saying that's what happened to us. I'm just saying this is just a word. That we need to understand that we shouldn't be ashamed of the truth. We shouldn't be afraid. And there have been times, and I've admitted it, I admitted it to Jim and Ruth recently, that there are some times when I'm afraid to say what I really want to say because I think people might withdraw from it. But today I'm not afraid. I'm putting my heart on the line and saying, hey, how deep is your love? How deep is your obedience? Because that's what it is. It's... Let me read these scriptures in closing. These are a mirror for you. These are for you to, to ask yourself the question, how deep is my love? How strong is my discipleship? How far am I willing to go to take up the cross that Jim spoke about last week? The first one is obvious. I've already quoted it. If you love me, you will keep my commandment. So, what we're doing is out of love. But how deep is that love for you? Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. These are commandments, right? These, these are the commands that Jesus really is talking about. Consider how you can stimulate each other to love and good deeds, not forsaking the assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So when you come together, it's to encourage each other But if you don't come together, you can't do that. And the writer to Hebrews is just saying, look, some people have stopped attending. Some people have stopped coming and sharing and and, and stimulating their brothers and sisters. And he's saying, don't do that. Keep coming. (laughs) And then, that was gathering together. And then this one is serving 1 John 3 we know love by this that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him how does the love of God abide in him little children let us not love with word or with tongue but in deed and truth that's, that is the challenge of real Christian love, is when we see a need, is the love so real that we actually deal with that need? If we don't, then our faith is like dead, as James said. And this is quite a big one, really, surrender of material possessions. Jimmy, I think, spoke about this a little bit last week. Luke 14. So then... This is, this is hard, but this is what Jesus said, the Son of God. Can you hear this? Can you take this into your heart today? None of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. <clears throat> or in the Amplified it says, renounce, surrender, claim to, give up and say goodbye to. <laughs> you know... The thing about surrender is that it's not that God doesn't want you to be blessed with things. I'll give you an example because I thought about this this morning. You know, Jesus um, was inviting people to follow him and one of of the persons said to them, "My, my father has died, let me go and bury him first and then I'll follow you. Remember that one? And Jesus said, "Let it sounds horrible this, doesn't it? It sounds harsh. Let the dead bury their dead and you follow me. But do you know what I really believe? And maybe I'm 
I don't want to rewrite scripture and I don't want to put anything into the word of God that Jesus didn't mean. But I think the issue there was not the burying of the father, which a lot of people say it is. I don't think it is. I think the issue there was the surrender of the guy's heart and will to God. And I think that if the guy said, yes, Jesus, I'm I'm all yours, he probably would have said, that's fantastic. I'll I'll see you tomorrow but go and bury your dad and honour your father. Have you got me? I'm not saying that that's what... You, I don't know, but as I was meditating on it today, it was almost as though I felt the Holy Spirit gave me a different take on it, that it was not about the funeral. It was about the guy's will. He was, it was like Isaac was going to be killed by Abraham. Abraham had a promise and, and God said, kill him sacrifice him on this altar and he was willing he had the dagger in his hand and he was halfway down to killing his son when God said stop I provided a a, a ram in the thicket and I think for us when it comes to surrender we often think oh that means I've got to give up everything I've got to give away all my possessions and have nothing and be poor no 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 That's not God's plan. God's plan is to bless us. But what he's desiring from us is the desire to say, do you know what? Even if following you meant I'd be poor, I will. Like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Right? Bow down and worship this idol, the king said, and they said, no, we won't. And if you chuck us in that fiery furnace, God will rescue us, he said. Amen. And he did. But you know what they said? And this is, this is the heart of the disciple. This is what I'm getting at. This is what, how I see the future of the church. Those three said, even if, he will rescue us, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to your God. So it's like, if, if, if God calls you to follow him and give up everything, you say, yeah, I will, because I know you're going to bless my life. But even if you don't, I'm going to be a disciple. Even if I lose out, even if I have nothing left, even if whatever, even if my whole family deserts me because I want to follow God, I will. But don't forget all those promises I read out because actually when we truly surrender there's so much blessing for us. See Matthew 7, this is a strong one. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father. You see, we can be in church and say, Lord, Lord, we can sing songs, we can have a Christian smile, we can have a Bible, we can, we can say, Lord, Lord. But the crunch is, are we doing the will of the Father? And that's what I'm sort of trying to get across to you today. It's tough, isn't it, this? Is this hard? I mean, you, I didn't want to do this. God persuaded me to be obedient to him. And my wife, I shared a little bit with my wife a couple of days ago. She said, well, don't be hard. She said, you don't want to scare people away. I said, no, I don't. I don't want to do that. But Jesus did scare people away. And lots of them left him at that point. And they turned to the other 12 and said, you want to go as well? Because Jesus wanted real disciples, you see. He wanted the people who would say, even if, no matter what, I'm going to follow you. So, let's not just say, Lord, Lord, but let's do God's will. James 4. Now, this is a, this is a, uh, a meaty one, this is. <clears throat> Come now, you who say, and we've all done this, haven't we, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and we'll spend a year there and we will engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow for you're just a vapour that appears for a while and vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, 
if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. That's, a, that's, that's quite a hard one. That's about really the major decisions of life. You know, business, finance, marriage, children, work, all kinds of issues of life that we can say, I'm going to do this tomorrow. But what the Holy Spirit is saying here is, don't just say that, but, but have a prayerful heart in all your endeavours and choices of life where you're going to spend this day or that day or that week. If God wills, if that's your will, Father, I will start that business. If that's your will, Father, whatever it happens to be. We're nearly there, guys. Oh, two more scriptures. I remember these scriptures from when I was a little a baby Christian and they were a real challenge to me and, but I remember thinking you know what I'm going to go the whole hog uh, I'm not going to be a weak half hearted Christian I want to be all in because I know there's a lot of blessing in God I want to be all in anybody here want to be all in one of you anyway <laughs> two well, three counting me. Ian can't put his hand up because he's playing. I know he's all in. <clears throat> right, the, uh, second to last. It's about not loving the world. Well, we love the world in the sense that God loved the world and sent his son. We love the world because we care about their eternal soul. But this is something different that Jesus was saying or John the Apostle. He says, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's, that's strong, isn't it? That's, that's a very strong mirror that God's putting up for the church. He's saying, Don't love the world. Don't, don't get taken in by the, the love of things out there because if you do, it's, it's going to drive out the love of God from your heart. <clears throat> For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. The world's passing away and it's lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. I want to live forever and yeah it's all free gift it's salvation is a free gift but faith that doesn't show itself by doing the will of God is not real faith it's Lord Lord and in that day he'll say depart from me and then finally oh, thank goodness for that but this is all the Bible isn't it you know I don't preach like this very often. Am I right? I don't, do I? You're smiling at me, but you're not saying, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I should do it more. <clears throat> Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your body as a living and a holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So, friends, worship, it can be, I surrender all. It can be that, of course. We, we do worship God for a while in church and it's very important that we don't forsake the assembling together and we come together to thank God and worship and stimulate one another but worship is not just singing songs it's your whole lifestyle it's your total surrender of your will it's you saying not my will but yours Lord and I want to live for you I don't want to make any more decisions that are my will I want to hear from you and I want to put it into action 
because of all those amazing, amazing benefits that I will have length of days and years of life and peace, that I will have favour with God and man, that I will have straight paths to walk in, that my body will find healing and that I will be filled in my barns and my vats will overflow because God is my God and he loves me and because he loves me, he disciplines me to walk in his path and in his way. Are you glad you came? (laughs) Be honest. You can say, no, uh, I'm struggling with this obedience thing and this surrender thing. That's fine, it's okay to be honest. As Ian was saying, you know, well, I've got a way to go yet. I have. After... 51 years 51 years I've been following the Lord I thank God for that I thank God for you all you lovely lovely people you are the foundation of the church going forward you are going to see wonderful things this is about our future church this is about what God is going to do in and through us as we lay down our lives and say I'm here for you God and not for myself. I lay down my life. I take up the cross and I follow you, Lord. Can you stand up and say amen? I want you to respond, all right? Uh, You know, Jesus said, if you hear the word, but that's all you do, it's a waste of time. I want you just to close your eyes, bow your head and close your eyes and just think for a moment about where you are in your life and are you can you say I'm in the centre of God's will or is the Holy Spirit maybe making you feel a little bit uncomfortable today and saying well yeah there's something else I'll require of you and can you say I'll do it Lord I've had to do this a few times in my Christian life. I've had to say, I've struggled, I've battled against God's will. I've fought the Lord. But then in the end I said, Lord, I, no, I'm going to go your way. And I want you, as you're thinking now and praying, I want you to be able to say, Lord, I'm willing. Or if you're not willing, say, Lord, I'm willing to be made willing. <laughs> I'm even just that much, Lord. I know I should be willing, but I'm fighting it. But Lord, can you suffer my heart and make me willing? Because God says, my beloved children, I want to bless your life. I want to prosper you. I want to give you good things. I've come that you might have life. I've come that you might have abundant life through the kingdom of God. So Father, thank you for helping me today. And I pray that we all will take your word very seriously, Lord, and we will go forward and see the absolute incredible blessing of following you. The joy of walking in your way. Amen. 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 God bless you.